it's so wonderful to be Thursday today. It's it's Thursday today, and doesn't we know what that means? At this time, we have been so privileged for a long time already to be able to every Thursday unpack a new depth of God's word, a new um, from a couple of Galileans, um, and to unpack from God's word different things each time. I think it's so phenomenal and. I myself, I'm learning stuff, and uh, and it's just it's just a blessing. Uh, hello to everyone there. Don't forget the way we like to do it is feel free to ask questions. We're gonna try. Just go ahead and type your question in the comments. We're gonna try our hardest to get to them during this time. And I understand that you are in En Gedi, right? Like King David's. He wasn't king yet, but David's hideaway. Um, right. So you know, I'm going there tomorrow. Tomorrow I'm going there with my kids. It's a great place to take kids. If some of you may have been there before. Um, and we're going to take our kids. We're going to go swimming and go to the Dead Sea. And that's the plan for tomorrow. It's wonderful. But yeah, Andre, for those of you who don't know Andre, he's a wonderful, wonderful scholar, historian, man of God, a friend. And I'm very honored to call you a friend. And I love the insight that you bring. So feel free to share your heart. Amen. Thank you, Chaim. It's such an honor and privilege and joy to be sharing uh, again <clears throat> with you one of um, one of these uh, one of the really highlights i think in israel that we have that specifically has to do with the the desert when we think about <clears throat> the desert there's there are many many different amazing 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 places in israel we have in the desert and um, the highlight would be the highlight of this oasis, the, the oasis in the midst of the desert uh, next to the Dead Sea, the driest place, the lowest place on the planet. And in this oasis, we learn so much. It's like a classroom where we can just understand the Bible, understand the context of the Bible, the ancient scroll that you see here. It's just the Bible, you know, and and, and then when we think of the Engedi, of the oasis of Engedi, you know, the description that Solomon, King Solomon, the wisest man, he gave, he says, that my beloved is to me a cluster of Hannah blooms in the vineyards of Engedi. There, there's some, some kind of a, a fragrance that comes out of, of this place throughout the centuries. And so we want to we wanna look a little bit, let take a closer look into what happened and how this sheds light into our lives. Even today, we'll We'll discuss about the ancient community uh, of Engedi that lived here 1,500 years ago and 2,000 years ago. What was going on in their city? This was all excavated, phenomenal excavations, by the way. Not, uh, not really, um, not too long ago, renovated again. So for those who are planning to visit, definitely there are some new stuff to see. <clears throat> Absolutely phenomenal. We'll talk about the springs in the desert, the springs in the desert, the beautiful waterfalls, uh, how they were throughout throughout the, the thousands of years, really thousands of years. We have these uh, these springs in the desert, springs that made this piece of land an oasis, not just just a a uh, you know uh, a, a small little oasis, but but a large impactful place. It's a center of 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 industry of the deserted of place in the desert that had probably the heart. Of, uh, of the particular agriculture that suited to this particular climate as an ecological niche here in the heart of the desert. This is really what it is. So, so there's so many different subjects we can touch on, you know, from a, a, a ecological niche to, to the springs and to geology and to the, the nature and all of that stuff and the people back then. And their people, by the way, lived here for thousands of years, 6,000 years ago, there, there, there were people here, a prehistoric community that lived here, and they found the remains of this. But anyway, let's, let's look at it through the lens of the Bible to help us understand, help us to understand some of the things. First of all, let's do a geographic uh, description here. Geographic description, overview, what do we have, what are we looking at? So, here is the, the uh, map of um, uh, Google Maps, okay, of Israel. You can see uh, Samaria, here's Nablus, right? Samaria, Jerusalem, Judea, Hebron, the mountains of Israel, coastline, 
Okay, on the west, you have the Dead Sea, Jordan Valley, Jericho. Here, of course, the whole of the Negev desert of Israel, southern Negev. And here we have En Gedi. Here's En Gedi highlighted on the shores of the Dead Sea. <clears throat> All right. Now, where do we find En Gedi in the Bible? How does the Bible, what do we see it in the Bible? And first time we come across the place En Gedi is in Joshua. In Joshua 15, we talk about a description. This is a description of the cities that were given into an inheritance to the tribe of Judah. Okay, tribe of Judah got an inheritance and it's in number several cities in the wilderness, okay, in the desert, in the wilderness. We'll talk about what that is. But the cities mentioned very clearly, Beit Arava, Midin, maybe connection to, we know Beit Arava. There is a, a, a settlement later on um, established uh, there. But anyway, we're talking about the northern section of the, of the Dead Sea. Okay, Beit Arava, Midin, maybe Modin, maybe something we're not sure exactly where. Then it has Sekaka. You see the Sekaka, Schacha in Hebrew? So Schacha is probably what most of the scholars agree is Qumran. If maybe you've heard about the caves of Qumran, Qumran caves. Okay, and th this, is, this is here. This is where, where you can see my, my mouse here, cursor. This is where Qumran is, okay, approximately just at the northern side of the Dead Sea. This is Qumran, where the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered and, and all the ancient you know, uh, writings there. And we'll, we'll talk more about this as we go. And then it continues on. Let's, let's talk about um, uh, Nishba, the city of salt. We don't know where these two are, but we suppose that this is the coast. Uh, we suppose that this is the, the coast of the Dead Sea. And here this ends with and and Gedi, six cities and their villages. So and Gedi alongside with other cities, probably on the shore of the Dead Sea, were part of the tribe of Judah. You look at the map, here you can see that the, the tribe of Judah has an enormous, pretty large area given to him, to this tribe, this very big tribe, and it has this whole section of the Dead Sea, right? All of this, all this desert. Now, before we continue on here, I, I have to explain to you something about Hebrew language. When we touch the subject of the desert, a wilderness, we need to understand because English, however, doesn't capture, doesn't have the right, correct interpretation and translation, okay, of what this is, or what is the desert, how would you, would you explain this, so we can understand better in our Bible, so, so there are two words that describe the Hebrew Bible gives for desert or wilderness, desert or wilderness there's in hebrew it one word describes both of this and uh, a dry land there's another word so for desert or wilderness hebrew bible uses the word midbar midbar and for the dry land hebrew bible uses the word tsiya tsiya dry land okay and david writes my my heart longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water eretz tsiya vayef Okay, so tsiya means dry land, completely dry land. There's no water at all. And, and it's insignificant. There's nothing gross. Tsiya, from that same root, tsiya, we have the word tsion, Zion. It's something insignificant, something small, something, you know, or some, like, like a little uh, something. Okay, similar, similar root. Uh, so we just have this two description in Hebrew Bible. Now, what does it mean, Midbar? What does it mean, desert or, or wilderness in Hebrew? So there are four explanations, four meanings of the word midbar. And that is absolutely phenomenal because when we begin to see them in the context of scriptures, it blows our mind because we, we begin to get this, the whole new understanding. So meaning number one, midbar, if, if you've studied Hebrew, you may, may know, you know, that it, the first word midbar, meaning of the word midbar is to speak, medaber speaks, okay, davar, the word, davar niabasar, a word became flesh, a word, davar, midbar, a place of the word, a place where you hear the voice, okay, where, you're, where, where someone is speaking, the desert, wilderness is a place that speaks, or some, or voice speaking in the wilderness, uh, if you think for, throughout the Bible, all the great men of God, beginning from Moses, who had a revelation, who heard the voice of the Lord in the desert. 
and, and Joshua after him. And, and you think of Elijah, who's been in the wilderness. Think of John the Baptist. Think of David, who spent many, many years in wilderness and, and had an encounter, an encounter with God. Think of, of Yeshua himself, who has been, has been tempted in the wilderness. Okay, and so throughout these, these stories of the Bible, I mean, name it, you know, they're all there because there is something that reveals in the desert, and that is the voice, okay, to speak the voice, a word is heard in the desert. That's meaning number one. And meaning number two of the word midbar is, is meaning of the word leader. Leader is not a literal translation, but it means leader simply why? Because who is a person who is speaking is a leader. The one who speaks in the wilderness, he is a leader. Okay, you listen to him. So, so think about development of a leader, leadership development in the desert, all the Bible filled with the stories how the leader, leadership was developed in the wilderness, in the desert. Okay, so this is the place for leadership development. You know, those who, who want to do a leadership development retreat, guys, I'm just, I'm giving you, you know, this is, you know, you just, you have to remember this. You want to become a leader, you come to the desert. Okay, this, this I didn't, you know, invented it. This is what the Bible says. This is how the Bible <clears throat> develops. God develops leaders in the Bible. He's in the desert. Okay, number three, this is Hebrew. Here it is. We're continuing with the word midbar is the word cleansing or purification, okay? In Hebrew, it simply uses the word lehadbir, lehadbir, which means to eliminate, to cleanse, to get rid of. We, you know, this guy that you, you come, you, or, you know, invite to e exterminate all the like cockroaches and all that kind of stuff. We call him, we call him hamadbir, okay? The one who is gonna use his, his tools and what's gonna do, he's gonna spray whatever. And so he's going to just exterminate all those gar garbage, all those insects that you don't want out of the way. So, so to exterminate or to, to really clean, or clean, get out, you know, empty, get rid of stuff, clean. Okay, this is, it means lahadbir from that same root. Think about it, desert, wilderness is a place that cleanses you, that gets all the guts, all the, the garbage out of you. It's just a place of cleaning. If you think the context of the Bible, think of Isaiah 40. What does God say? God says that, you know, <clears throat> prepare, who was th that quoted by John the Baptist, right? He says that, that the voice of the one crying in the desert, midbar, in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, preparation. Get, you know, all the high place made low, the low place made high, you know, get, re prepare the, 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 the way for my people, God says in another place. It's, it's this get rid, remove the rocks, remove the obstacles. This is what is happening in the desert. This is what's going on there. Could you go for a second back to leader, the Hebrew word you said leader, which, what, what was, what'd you say? Leader is not literal word that is used here, there. I think it has to do with other languages, maybe Akkadic ancient language, but the concept of a leader, how do you define a leader? He's the one who speaks, right? It has to do with the speaking in the desert. A person who speaks is a leader. Why? Because everything else is quiet. It's the quietest place. It's not a rainforest. And I know that you were getting our leaders get their direction from God and from the, the highest source, and they really receive, they know how to hear. And what I love about Sakha, one of these, these surrounding cities here, is that's like canopy or like, like a sukkah. There's a schach on a sukkah, a covering of his banner, his over us is love. The canopy of stars is above us. And it's like just connect, it's yeah, getting rid of the noise and connecting to under his banner, under his. Yeah, I'm excited. <laughs> right. So, so back to, to the cleansing part, to, to get rid of the, this is the cleansing, prepare the way. You know, Isaiah prophesies in the desert, prepare the way of the Lord, not in the mountains, not in the seashore, not in the forest, in the desert. Why? Because this is where you prepare the way of the Lord. If you realize a little bit, I mean, I know maybe you have been with us when we discussed the Garden of Eden and, and all that kind of stuff. But, but look, En Gedi is on the east of Jerusalem. It's on the east side of the desert. Presence of God coming 
from the east is entering the house from the east right the restoration is from the east back you know this is so where you prepare the way the front gate of this land let me repeat it again for those of you that we talk about aliyah in ohio we're all you know, strong willing you know encourage aliyah we see, you know all the, the 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 nowadays modern jewish people they all come back from you know plain from the west from the ocean look the front gate of this land let me be very clear biblically a front gate is not the ocean it's not mediterranean a front gate of this land is the east children of israel entered across the jordan from the east right right as the first adam and eve right on the first people were exiled to the east so the restoration is back from the east right babylon to the east is a symbol of exile and that movement through the front gate okay it's prophetic it's spiritual it th this is the front gate so so think about the cleansing the preparing the way of the lord he says god says what who is the one who who is that who are you coming from edom you remember that who is that coming from Edom? You know, garments stained with blood. Edom is on the east, right? This is this journey. This is the journey of, of even, even uh, the, the spirit of God coming to take possession again of the land and of, of, of the city of the great king. And so, so this is the, the desert is there to prepare the way. This is the bottom line. This is it. So, so it's going to happen there. So when you have the ministry of the Messiah, Yeshua, He's going to prepare for this ministry. The testing is going to be in that very desert. Okay, John the Baptist, the spirit of Elijah, would be right there. By the way, Elijah himself, I don't know if you know this, but when he had that time of, what, three and a half years of drought, where was he spending most of his time? Where? In that very desert, right? In the Crete, in, in Nachal Crete, right? That this, is, this is the between Jerusalem and Jericho. That's in desert. Okay. I think we, we covered this number three, cleansing. Number four, the last one, very important, very important meaning, again, in Hebrew, ancient Hebrew language, connected with the ancient Akkadic language, same root, uses the word lehadbir, again, dbir, midbar, lehadbir, tson, which means flocks, okay, sheep, goats. Midbar means a place suitable for, 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 uh, for um, animals, for flocks. Suitable place for flocks. Midbar is a definition of particular condition of the land, which is not enough, does not, does not have enough rain to grow, gra to grow grain or vineyards or, or olive trees or anything like that. But it's enough rain to get those little, you know, those little bushes, the little, little, um, small, little spiky kind of, uh, uh, so that the flocks of sheep and goats, they can graze and they can just, just survive on that. In fact, if you look again at the map here, look at the map here, look at the left-hand side. In the middle of the tribe of Simeon, you have the city of Beersheba. Okay. Now, Beersheba and Arad, Okay, all where I'm, I'm pointing right, right here to you. This whole area of the northern Negev Desert, northern Negev Desert, all this area is the best area for flocks. No wonder that Abraham came and settled in Beersheba. Why? Because he was shepherd. Isaac in Beersheba, he was shepherd. Jacob, same thing. The journey was the mountains and Beersheba because Beersheba is the perfect place for flocks perfect place for them to to uh, walk around and eat and pasture okay so all of these words speak about the desert speak about wilderness or desert okay and some parts speak about Tzia, dry land david spoke about particular area of engedi this area okay there are two deserts in israel one of them is the negev desert and it's here where Beersheba is and south this is Negev Desert. And then there is a second desert that's called Judean Desert. Judean Desert is the area of the Dead Sea. The area of the Dead Sea is called Rain Shadow Desert. In other words, it shouldn't be a desert, but because of topography, it became desert. The clouds go from Mediterranean, 
they they go up to the mountains they rain down the rain and then there's a very very sharp drop to minus 420 meters below sea level this is over a thousand meters drop from here a thousand meters drop and evaporation of the dead sea is so high so that it literally takes the clouds and just whoosh, and, and throws them over the whole valley and to the mountains of Moab, okay, the mountains of Jordan, and there they rain again. And so there's just simply no rain falls in. Then everything is super dry. This is the dry land. All right, so this is geographic uh, overview. Let's talk a little bit about the community. The community of En Gedi, because of its being oasis, has been developing over the centuries. I mentioned there is a proof of prehistoric uh, calcolithic community on the mountain, on, on the mountains here up on the top, or you can see my micro stories there. Okay, th there and the mountain next to it, there, there was a temple that they worshiped. Uh, there were different tools that they found from gold and bronze that they used there. I'm talking about over 5,000, 6,000 years ago. This is really, really old, old time um, because of the water and of the climate. Now, there, what we know about the community of En Gedi, obviously the city mentioned in Joshua. In other words, there were people here already. Then we come to a time of second temple period. Second temple period before the destruction of the second temple okay, in Jerusalem by Rome. I'm talking about 70 AD. Okay, there was a strong community living here in En Gedi who were against rebellion. They were against rebellion against Romans, right? They say, we don't want to participate in a rebellion against Rome. Why? What was so special in that, that community? What was the secret of their success, of their prosperity? The secret of their prosperity lies in one particular industry. That particular industry that continued on through the Second Temple period and into the, the Byzantine era or the Talmud and the Mishnah area, era. You can see the remains of a city, a large city. You, you wouldn't expect that kind of a city in the desert. And if you look on the picture on the right, you have a floor, mosaic floor of a synagogue, which is one of the most beautiful mosaics we have from that period of time. I'm talking about 1500 years ago. Absolutely phenomenal. That has some encryption on it, some, some writings on, uh, on Greek language, uh, there's just, just really, really cool things that we could see besides this beautiful mosaic, a rich community. The secret of their prosperity lies in a particular industry that has to do with agriculture, agricultural niche of this climate. And that has to do, here's an encryption, with this encryption, so we'll know, I mean, I'm not going to uh, uh, explain to you um, the, the word by word here. You can find it online. But basically, there is an encryption even in synagogue in Aramaic. I think they put it here. And they say here, this is what they say. They say this. May a man be cursed and may him and his seed, okay, his family will be killed, will be wiped out from the earth. Cursed is the man who will reveal the secret of the parsimon incense, of the, of the balsam, of the spice, of this some kind of a fragrance, a special, special thing that they have produced. Okay, they, 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 it's, not a, it's called parsimon, not a parsimon that we know today. That's something totally different. But there was a plant, and people study this, they, they, they made, there was an attempt to, to, to regrow it now, and they're trying to realize there's a lot of studies done on this, but people in En Gedi knew for ages, for, for generations, how to grow this particular plant that they called parsimon. Some other historians call it the balsam. The balsam of En Gedi, Greek and Roman historians mentioned. They said that this had a perfume. This perfume had so much power that it's just the Roman Empire. They, they, they were just simply 
are crazy about it. They, they made a, a, a they made a agreement, okay, with Getty that they will pay taxes by this perfume, and they left them alone. Think about it, Queen Cleopatra from Egypt. She she made inquiry to buy regularly. The, the production of this balsam, of this perfume from Engedi. There were other copies of this particular plant that they, we were still questioning this. It's not exactly clear what was the way, how did they collect uh, this, this uh, tsuf, you know, this, 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 this uh, 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 liquid out of this tree. What was this, how it was done exactly? What are the conditions of growth? They have no idea, but this was the most precious in the ancient world that time perfume they could put their hands on. Think of Cleopatra, think of the Roman empires and emperors. This was there. And so they knew the secret how to do it to a best, um, best results. And so the encryption in synagogue 1500 years ago, it says clearly, may a man be cursed, died, and his seed, his family going to die if he will reveal the secret of this balsam, the secret of, of uh, uh, prosperity, really phenomenal stuff. That explains why they didn't want to participate in the rebellion. That really explains a lot to us. Okay, nowadays we have this beautiful place to visit with ruins of the city, with a, a mosaic floor of the synagogue. Um, Haim, you wanted to add something? Just, uh, just uh, wanted to ask you. I mean, what is it? What do you feel? What do you feel when you can practically read? I mean, these letters. You can recognize these letters, and you can practically read. Just we, I can practically read exactly. And we're talking, you know, three, four, five, six thousand years ago, and and then and some of those prophets, prophets may be visited there, and their words, as we know, were found in the Book of Isaiah, right nearby in Qumran. But um, my question is, what do you think when, when it says they will return home from the north, the south, the east, and the west, and then and now you see it happening? We both Galileans are have returned home in in and made Aliyah fulfilling these scriptures. Like, what is? How does that make you feel? Well, this is, it makes me feel amazing. But I think that that we're we're we are we're living the Bible. I mean, not even I, I don't know. Like, I was a young teenager when my parents decided to come to Israel make Aliyah, right? So, but it's just uh, amazing to see how the Bible coming alive. But, but I think for, the, uh, for our international group that is listening to us, th th I think that the most important thing is to understand how God looks at this and, and, and what we need to wake up and realize what is going on in, in these days we're living in, in these years. And, and I'm not talking about you know, 30 years ago, uh, a wave of immigration. I'm talking about now and what's coming next. Because, because look, we're, we're still, we're still ahead of a great, great wave of, of re re return. And so I, I will finish with this. Okay. We'll talk about the springs in the desert. Okay. And how, how the Psalm says, I'll return them think as the streams. So we'll, we'll talk about a little bit the streams, the flush floods, how that looks so that we can make a spiritual parallel to what's going to happen right okay so and it's talk almost about raining this. right now it's yeah it is it's true we also we had a couple of drops um just in, uh, about two hours ago here in in haifa area anyhow well let's go, go back to engedi community of engedi um phenomenal place to come and see and visit let's move on here here i want to touch to probably most familiar, most famous story about this place. And that story, of course, about David. What do we know about Engedi? Engedi, the stronghold, the stronghold of David, stronghold of David. Okay. And it's just phenomenal. Let's, let's, let's look a little bit about, I mean, on the Bible here. I want to go a little bit quickly, short into uh, the biblical uh, account that happened here at Engedi with David. Before we go on, I just want to highlight the meaning of the word Engedi in Hebrew. Engedi, 
very interesting. The word ein or ein in Hebrew is an I. Okay, I is ein, but it also means spring. So the word for I and the word for spring is exactly the same word in Hebrew. And it's not a coincidence, but because a source of water, source of life, it, it really like an eye. It also looks similar because there's water, you know, coming out, tears coming out of our eyes. Same thing, the water comes out of a spring. Also, we talk about spiritual, like an eye is a, a doorway to the soul, into, you know, it's like a gate. It's, it's just this, a, a way for, uh, for, for the soul. And so a spring that comes out in, in, of course, that is the Hebrew language here. So ein is I or spring. Gedi means goat or young goat. Okay, young goat, a spring of the goats, the eye of the goats, spring of the goats. This is the meaning of this place. It's been here because of the goats, obviously, because there were these ibex. We'll see a picture of them in a moment. And uh, look at this, the spring. This is the, one of the waterfalls, one of the most beautiful waterfalls here. It's called David's Wadi. Um, it's just really, really beautiful and, and nice. And of course, when David was here, some of the things that he wrote, I believe, very significant to what he saw. An example of Psalm 42, as the deer, means that ibex, pants for the water brooks. So pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God for the living God. That understanding of, this, of hunger and thirst for God can only come to you when you're in the dry place like this and you really understand what it means to find a spring in the desert, to find an oasis in the desert. This is where you're going to long to get there. You really will experience a hunger for come into this presence of God. If this is something that we can identify, we can, we can really desire God this way, we will get it. If we say, oh, God, you know, you know, he's just there sitting and waiting for me to, you know, to get a couple of minutes off my busy day to sit down and open my Bible. Come on now, this is, this is nonsense. This is absolutely not the story. The idea is, I am desiring God to an extent that this is a matter of life and death. If that goat, if that animal in the desert will not get to the spring, he's going to die. Do you feel this way when you think of God? Your God, if I'm not going to get into the presence of God, I'm going to die. It's, it's that vital for me. Okay, so this illustrates what David wrote because he spent quite a time in the wilderness. Here's an exa another example of amazing description what david wrote i believe in these places or about these places what does he use as this, this phenomenal second samuel then quoted in psalm uh, i think psalm 18 quotes the same thing he says for who is god except the lord who is a rock think of the rocks here this is where you find stronghold who is a rock except our god listen carefully to the words god is my strength and power and he makes my way perfect now let me pause here what does it mean? What it means make my way perfect? Think about it. We pray and we think about it. We think, oh, okay, you know, make, prepare the way, clean the way. Let me just walk straight into my destiny. No, you know, my way perfect. Listen, we don't understand what it means perfect. Perfect doesn't mean that there will be no problems. Because the next sentence explains us what it means perfect way. And the perfect way is this. He makes my feet like the feet of deer, of ibex. What does that mean? Why does David need a feet like ibex? Why do we need a feet like the deer? Because those ibex, those deers, they jumping like nothing. They just up on the top. They just ride all, all over these rocks and they don't care. They don't afraid. They're just there. And David says, there will be, my way is going to have problems my way is going to have obstacles but i don't ask you to remove the obstacles are you with me i'm not asking you to remove obstacles i'm asking you to give me a feat so that i can overcome them that could jump like the deer like those ibex who overcome those obstacles and sets me on my high places he teaches my hands to make war so that my arms can bend 
a bow of bronze. You, you see that? That gives us a little bit of perspective here in the band. Here are the ibex. You can see them. They're coming there to drink water from, this, from the brook daily, from the, from the springs uh, on a daily basis, morning and evening, right? They come. Uh, there, there are some caves where they, where they sleep, where they stay. Okay, there, there are many of ibex all over there. There are many of them. And I, I'd like us to look into the text here uh, of 1 Samuel chapter 24. I know, I, I know you guys ready for a little Bible study here. But those who are watching or will be uh, looking at the recording. 1 Samuel 24. What does it say? We're talking about this very phenomenal account. The account, uh, let's just um, back up one, one verse before, and that's 1 Samuel 23, verse 29. Okay, you could open up it later. Let me just read it quickly so we'll have it. Then David went up from there and dwelt in strongholds at En Gedi. This is the stronghold of David. Verse 12, chapter 24. And that happened when Saul had returned from following the Philistines, that it was told him, saying, Take note, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. This is where David is going. This is the place. It's not, you know, this is the area, right? So this is where this event happened. Verse 2, then Saul took 3,000 chosen men from all Israel and went to seek David and his men. Listen carefully, where? On the rocks of the wild goats. These are the goats. This is exactly fits absolutely the description of the place, you know, perfectly. We're definitely in the story. Verse 3, so he came to the sheepfolds by the road where there was a cave. Now, there are many different caves. You see a picture of a cave here. There are caves below toward the Dead Sea, okay? And there are caves above, above the waterfalls in the upper part of En Gedi. So, so, so which, depending which way they went, I really don't know exactly. But some of the places, those, they had, they had sheepfolds and there was a cave, okay? Um, sorry. Sorry. Uh, my computer freaking out for a moment. Let me try to oh, uh, no. wait yeah. a minute. It's amazing. While well, you're we'll doing... still do this uh, this uh, study. Okay. I hope it will be okay. Wait a minute. Oh, where is it? Sorry. Come back. Come back. Come back. Come back. Come back. Come back here. Perfect. Come back. Great. Okay. Wait a minute. Here. So um, there was a cave. So there were caves. There are some big caves. But those of you that have been to the air of the Dead Sea, let me tell you something. On the in the region of the Dead Sea, especially on the southern part, there are caves that are miles long. There are caves that are miles long there underneath i mean i've been on one of the caves on the southern of the dead sea we walked for a couple of hundred meters maybe maybe a, maybe i don't know 20 minutes 30 minutes in the cave and then we saw that opening you know opening like a like a shaft that the sun rays were coming and there's there's even people that go and they hike for two three days in the cave two three days overnight in caves so there are caves now, I'm not exactly sure what size of the cave we're looking at, but it wasn't a small cave. It was a big enough cave for David to be in there. But if we look in the text a little bit closer, we will see that it's not about the cave. The story is not about the cave. It's about what happens. So let's read on here. Let's see what happens. Verse 3. Um, so he came to the sheepfolds by the road where there was a cave and Saul went in to attend to his needs. There are some other Bible translations that doesn't use the word attend his needs, but most of the translations do. And I have no idea why. It has nothing to do with needs. If you read Hebrew, it simply says that he went 
להסך את רגליו. להסך, like סככה, להסך את רגליו. In other words, he went in to cover his feet. He went to the cave to cover his feet. I, I'm sorry, guys, it's just maybe, uh, you know, sensitive subject. Listen, in the Bible, if you need to go pee, you go pee. You don't looking for cave. If you need number two, you go number two. You don't go into a cave to do this. You don't, you don't. It does just, you know, it's just not in that mindset even. Why was Saul needed to go into a cave? I'll tell you why, very simply. They walked in the desert for a couple of hours. It was hot. What kind of clothes do you think they have? Okay, they have this, this short, you know, uh, like, a, like a skirt kind of, you know, kind of type of, of, of garments. Garments that was, uh, you know, around maybe their knees or so maybe below, below their knees. That was the guy, and they had sandals, by the way. So think about it. You walk for a couple of hours in heat, right? And finally, you find a place, a nice cave that is on the way. You don't need to do anything. And Saul is a king, right? He needs, he says, give me a moment here. I just need to sit down in shade to cover my feet so I can rest and think and realize what's the next step. Where are we going to go? Now, there are 3,000 people with him. David and his men who had a great, they had a great, uh, they were spies. They, of course, knew that there are 3,000 men coming after them. They were, what, 600, 400, 500, 600 men? They knew this is, you know, a lost battle. We can't fight them like this. So they saw their coming. They came to a cave and they hid in the cave. Why did they hid in the cave? Very simple, because you have one opening of the cave. Okay, you, you have 3,000 soldiers. They can't fit in together all at once. So they're going to come in groups. And as they come in groups, they can deal with them in groups. They can kill them in groups. Right? You're following. That was the strategy of David. And, and so what happens is, Saul himself, only he comes and he just simply comes to the entrance. He just gets a couple of feet in the cave enough to get shade because it's refreshing. And he's there sitting. You know what? He probably fell asleep. That's what I think. He probably just laid down there and just fell asleep to rest. He just wanted to cover from, from heat to rest. And this is what happens next. David and his men are staying in the recesses of the cave. They're deep in. They're at the back. They're, they're, they're pushed to the back, okay, to the back wall of the cave. And here's what happens, this phenomenal event. Then the men of David said to him, this is the day of which the Lord said to you, behold, I will deliver your enemy into your hand that you may do to him as it seems good to you. Now, I want to ask you a question, all of us. Do you know a scripture in which God says to David, there will be a day I'm going to give your enemy into your hands and you're going to do to him whatever you want. Is there a verse like this? The answer is no. That's not what God said to David. God promised to David this. He said, there will be a day you will become king. You will be a king. That's the word of God. You will be a king. David knows how it works. You, he cannot be king while there's somebody else king. So if he wants to be king, he needs to get rid of the king that is now so that he can become a king. His men know it. Where are they sitting? In the recesses of the cave. Do you know what's in the recesses of the cave? What's going on there? What, who gets to the recesses of the cave? I'm talking about animals. What's going on? Is there what? Bears, lions? No. You know what's there? Sick animals who want to die. They go in the cave deep to the end and they die. This is where they die in the desert. They feel they need to die. He looks for a cave, you know, kind of gets himself into a burial place and dies there. So David's men sitting on those corpse of those animals with that smell. And you know what they dream about? They dream about their David going to become a king, king. And when he becomes a king, they're going to get promoted from this place. They're going to get rich. They're going to get wealthy. They're going to get land. They're going to get authority. They're going to get all kinds of stuff. And so what they're doing is very simple. They, are, they know God's word to David, that he's going to be king. But they are going to interpret to David 
the way they understand this prophecy. They want David to take in his hands the fulfillment of this prophecy and, 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 to, and to kill him. Now David is listening to them and he's going to kill him. David is coming to kill Saul. David arose, verse 4, and secretly cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Pause here for a moment. Pause here for a moment. Why did he do this? Was not a gesture. David is a professional killer, guys. He knows how to do this. But this is not just a man. This man that is lying there is an anointed of God. What does it mean? It means that he has a covenant with God. And David has honor to God as everybody else that time. And he can't kill him while he's in his position of covenant with God. He needs to do something. He needs to get him off the covenant. How? What is the symbol of the covenant with God of the Jewish people? God gave clear order for the Jewish people to have a dress code that will express the covenant with God. And the dress code called the tzitzit. The blue and white shred, tassels that was on the corners of their robes. They walked like this. They had them on the corners, on the, four, on the sides of the robes as a symbol of the covenant with God. So Saul has these as a king, as an anointed of God. And so David, before he can kill him, he needs to cut him off of his covenant with God. It will allow David, give him a right to kill him. So David is going to cut one of these tassels. How, how I mean, you have to see it slow motion. This is phenomenal. I love this story. You can just imagine David as they are coming. One hand, he's cutting the tassel. And the second hand, he's going to the, for the throat. I mean, this is what's happening. You got to see the slow motion. Cutting the tassel and he's going to the throat. And the moment, the slow motion, he cuts the tassel. Holy Spirit is convicting his heart convicting his heart so much that it stops in the mid immediately not happened afterwards that david's heart troubled him because he had cut saul's robe he cut the tassel of the saul's robe the kanaf the corner right the hebrew bible says it kanaf and he said to his men the lord forbid that i should do this to my master the Lord's anointed to stretch out my hand against him, seeing he is anointed Messiah. The word anointed means Messiah. He is the Messiah of God. And David restraining his men with his words and did not allow them to rise against Saul. Because, I mean, I suppose David comes back to the Saul with, to, I mean, to, the, to his men. And they're like, what, what happened? And David's like, okay, I can't do it. He's an anointed. And they're like, okay, David, you got to sit, sit and rest. We, let us do the job. We're just, we're just going to kill him immediately. You know, you like whatever, overheated or you're too emotional. I mean, this is not the case. David is so strongly restrains them. He speaks to them. The Hebrew Bible uses very clear words here. She says that he, the word restrained in Hebrew in this context is the word to slaughter. He literally like slaughtered them with his words and not allow them to rise up against all. And so comes and leaves. David is there. Now, the most important story, the more important part of the story is the one following. So Saul goes up from the cave. David also rose afterward, went out of the cave and called out to Saul. And he begins to call him, oh, Lord, my king, you know, and the Saul stopped, you know, bowed down. And David said to Saul, why you listen to the words of man, etc. He begins to tell him the story, you know, I'm going to jump, scroll down to um, well, I, I have to read it. I can't scroll down. It's too important. Why do you listen to the words of men who say, indeed, David seeks your harm? Look, this day your eyes have seen that the Lord delivered you today in my hand in the cave. And someone, people, urged me to kill you. But my eye, remember the word eye. You remember, this is the eye of the goats. This is the spring of the goats. Okay, the place of the eye. And David says, but my eye has spared you. 
My eye has spared you. And I said, I will not stretch out my hand against my Lord, for he's the Lord's anointed. Okay. And it says, moreover, my father, see the tzitzit of your, your tzitzit is in my hand. For, for, for in that I cut off the corner of your robe and did not kill you. Now you see there is neither evil or rebellion in my hand. I have not sinned against you. Yet you hunt my life to take it. Let the Lord be judge between you and me. And let the Lord avenge me on you. But my hand shall not be against you. And then he continues on, you know, really, really submitting himself. Verse 16. Listen carefully. Verse 16 is the key verse. So it was when David has finished speaking these words to Saul that Saul said, Is this your voice, my son David? And Saul lifted up his voice and wept. You know, I'll stop you. For many, many years, I thought, what caused Saul to weep? You don't just make a king cry. In order to, to man, to king, to weep, there has to be something very, very significant. It's just not just getting emotional. There's something going on here behind the scenes. And here's what I believe is happening. Do you remember the reason that God despised Saul and removed him from kingdom? Do you know what happened to Saul? You remember, you remember how Samuel said to Saul very clearly, you need to be there and you have to wait for me. I'm going to come and then you're going to do sacrifice and we're going to, you know, take over the victory and everything. And, and Samuel is not coming and Saul is nervous there. You remember that? And the people are pressing and there's a movement and Saul can't wait to Samuel, and he makes a sacrifice by himself and not waiting. The moment he finishes, Samuel appears and says, what have you done? Why didn't you wait for me? I told you by the word of the Lord, you got to wait. He says, because you didn't wait for me. God is going to remove you from your kingdom. You see that? Because he had, Saul had a word from God through Samuel, but he took an initiative in, into his own hands to fulfill that word by his own strength. And David right here, right in this cave, had exactly the same option. If he would have listened to the man, to the voice of the people who said, let us interpret to you the prophecy for you. Let us interpret for you the prophecy God gave you. You see, how many times do we allow other people to interpret prophetic words to us according to their agenda? according to their expectation, according to their desire. And David, if he would have taken that initiative, that thing, and he would have killed him, he would be exactly like him. He would do exactly the same thing. But David said, no, I'm not going to listen. I'm going to wait for God to fulfill his word in his timing. I'm not going to fulfill it myself. And, and, and Saul understands it. And Saul weeps. And the next words, the Saul says, you are more righteous than I. Why? Because Saul did not wait for God's promises. But David said, I will wait. I'm not going to kill you. I'm going to wait for God to perform his word. That's why I believe Saul wept. And that's the end of the battle between David and Saul. That's it. They never had any issues later on until Saul's death at the mountains of Gilboa. But you see, there's such a deep understanding for us as the body of Christ, as the people of God. You ha we have to be very careful, but allow God to bring his word in his timing. Hallelujah. Yeshua says something about the eye. Remember, this is the eye of the goats. How did David act in this story? Yeshua says in Matthew 6, the lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? You see, David decided to act out of the good eye out of his eye was good. And that's why his body, his act was full of light. You see that? The, the, what does that mean, having a good eye? What's that mean? In Hebrew, we have this idea, bad eye, you know, the evil eye, right? We, we, we have this thing, which is like just some kind of a 
uh, superstition with beliefs and all kind of mysticism, whatever, all the kind of garbage that comes from mysticism. But the point that Yeshua is making is that the, what does it mean? Evil eye. Evil eye means where you look at somebody else and you envy him and you wish him to, to you wish him, you know, this luck. You wish him to, something bad will happen so that I will benefit. This means an evil eye. You look at someone and you say, oh, you know, I wish his business would, 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 uh, d- d- destroy, would be destroyed because I, I want this. I want my business to go up and this is, a, you know, this means an evil eye. A good eye is, you know what? A good eye means when you can rejoice somebody else's success. When you can look at somebody else's giftings and say, praise the Lord. Not, oh, I want this. But no, praise the Lord. And David is doing this. He looks and says, he is the Lord's anointed. I'm not going to touch him for he is the Lord's anointed. This is exactly what Yeshua is teaching. So I, I want to leave us with this. It's so, so powerful for me when we think about it. Now, En Gedi. En Gedi is destined to a restoration. Chaim, you want something to say? I mean, it's amazing. It's amazing. Go, go ahead, and then I'll bring some questions right. up. <laughs> okay. Now, En Gedi is a... a destined to restoration here's and get it you can see the whole thing here the whole mountain over here the spring on the on the on the north the spring of the south south it's just phenomenal oasis until now it's just amazing the springs are still operating it's great but it's destined to become a garden right it's destined to to see this has to do with aliyah here psalm 126 but just an amazing story of bringing back from captivity Okay, he's, he's giving an example here of bringing captivity, Aliyah, back. And he's talking about the streams in the south, the streams in the desert. Okay, the, the, this is an expression that comes from this psalm that is so profound about restoration. And so it, it's it, part of the restoration is bringing the Jewish people back. And the second part of restoration is back the garden, Garden of Eden. You probably remember we talked about that, that this area is part of their place where was the Garden of Eden. And, and God promised, right? He's promised in Ezekiel that he is going to restore this place. This is, by the way, garden from En Gedi Kibbutz, from the botanical garden there that have phenomenal stuff. If you just get uh, some water to this land, it's going to produce amazing stuff. So, so here, as Ezekiel says, and you, you know the scripture, but at the end, he says that the river that touches, it's going to heal the, the waters of the Dead Sea. And there will be fishermen that will stand by the, will, by the sea from En Gedi to En Eglaim. There will be places spreading for their nets. Okay, th- this is phenomenal. There will be fishermen here. And there's going to be all different kinds of fish, just like the Mediterranean. It's the destiny for restoration, a destiny for becoming a garden, a destiny like the springs in the desert that are going to, uh, to come and hit and people will, will, will totally, totally uh, be um, amazed by the restoration of the Jews. And then they're going to be later on amazed by the spiritual restoration of the river of life. Now, I want to finish with this what, three minute video of a flood, of a flash flood that happened here in En Gedi. You'll see some of the places. If you've been here, you realize I found it on YouTube. I, I made some modifications. But anyway, this is from YouTube. It's not my video. It happened in En Gedi. But just look at it with an un- idea, with understanding. What does it mean, streams in the desert? How does it look like? What can happen very fast, very power because, powerfully? Because this is a visual of what is in the spirit going to happen, both spiritual restoration, but both restoration of this great big wave of Aliyah. So I, I hope you should get the sound of the, of the video here as well. Oops, sorry. In 2008. Oh, man. Wow. 
coasting here to make sure it stops, right? It's now going to lean, I think. This is the waterfall of Engedi. David's spot. I think you're most certainly right. Well, that's the vet. It's like a lot of water. <laughs> Now what look what happens begin to happen they're there in the in in the winter it is raining in the desert yeah, right on top of and hailing yeah. it was hailing yeah, a while ago right yeah. so, uh, wow rich and did you see the hail i saw yeah. the hail that was very rain and hail in the desert and we're at engedi that's amazing where are you going now Wanda? Now, now the next thing, what happens? We are caught in the desert storms. Look at these waterfalls. Your idea. <laughs> <laughs> What's your idea? Dad. Just a few minutes later. Can you see that? That's the waterfall we were just at. Good thing we moved. Holy cow. <laughs> Hail, rain, mudslide, rocks. Yeah. Man! <laughs> play by play. Coming down the water there. We're stuck out here on the ledge for a little while. No, that looks like it's water going further and further out. Well, I won't pay for this next time. I want my money back. I want a free T-shirt. Bless you. Bless you. Sorry. You make sure you get her. You get her in that picture. She is the one who let us out. She and her comrades. There's the mountain we came off of. We had to hike. And bless God, oh my soul, there's the bus. We made it. Hallelujah. The sad news is, is that we know of at least one person is dead. And a couple others are missing. They're still searching for the with the helicopters. It's tragic tragic. Look at the results some of the flood. Just the main highway. Wow. Yes. Wow. Parts of the road are being washed down. So, wow. um, this just gives us the perspective of how this could be this peaceful small little waterfall into this massive flash flood that happens every winter. This one was at Getty that was very massive that changed a little of uh, oh, quite a lot of things there in, in, the, in the trail. The trail was changed because of that. And uh, there are flash floods happen every year. And there are this this, you know, obviously this was a tragedy, but this gives us an idea what happens, how is it's going to multiply the, the, the little spring, right? It's going to be just exploded by this, this massive flood, uh, um, you know, of water, but it would be uh, an aliyah. It's, this is how it's going to look like. There's going to be a flood of people coming uh, to this land, according to the word of God, and it's going to look you know, uh, challenging. So just give us an idea. And I'm, I we, we would love to give some time for questions. But thank you, Chaim. Well, really, thank you so much for all the effort it, it took to put all this together and everything. Um, people had some different questions, all, all kinds of ones. Um, one person said there's a there's a Eastern Orthodox uh, stream of Christianity that believes they've found, they hold the secret for thousands of years of that uh, perfume, that uh, persimmon or however you call it, 
uh -huh. that Bosom. And uh, so do you think that this that this was only for just smelling good or it was also like a balm, like a healing uh, eternal oh. life? Cream both, or something. both, definitely. According to historians uh, from uh, Greek and Roman Roman historians and the literature we have, they spoke about it and the, and the way they called it, they called it a balm, a balm from Engedi. It, it had it has the, that special. It's like a balm that healing, but it's not only healing. It was the smell. We also know that that smell, according to uh, the the Mishnah, the books of Talmud, we know that 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 smell was also used in the temple for the incense or, or has to do with the incense. One of those, one of the perfume, one of the spices or the, or the perfumes was used. This one was used there as well. So we're talking about something very, really, really expensive that has multi-purpose and, and, and just uh, phenomenal. Well, that's, that's so cool. I can't wait till someone discovers how to do that. I encourage everyone who's also watching to share this for sure. Uh, one more question. This is a, har a harder one, maybe. Uh, it says, uh, Hefzibah says, since Andre touched on Elijah and John the Baptist, I have this question. In John chapter 1, uh, verse 20, the priests and the Levites were asking John the Baptist, and they're saying, who are you? And he freely said, I'm not the Messiah. So they said, okay, you're not the Messiah, then who are you? Are you Elijah? Number two, and he says, no, I'm not, I'm not Elijah. Then they say, are you the prophet? Or I don't know, some translation might say a pro or one of the prophets or the prophet. So if it's the prophet, do they mean the Deuteronomy 18 verse 15, uh, where it says, God says, I will raise up a prophet from among you in your midst and him you must hear. So they first went from Messiah to Elijah to this prophet figure so but why is it three and not two why isn't it why why isn't it just um are you the messiah slash the prophet that one the messiah the prophet is there like a third it's it's very uh interesting question why three and not just not just the messiah is that prophet and or elijah okay first of all let's let's deal with the subject of elijah elijah is pretty similar similar i mean simple because the Malachi I talked about, he says, before the great day of the Lord, I'm going to send Elijah the prophet, change the hearts of the father to the children. So they relate, they refer to Malachi 4. And first of all, are you that, that one? And he says, no. Why does he say no? Well, because that's not what God told him to be. This is something we're talking about the later period of time. We're in the time we're living in. Now God's bringing spirit of Elijah, similar to John the Baptist. He wasn't a, full, a fullness of it. And he said, no, I'm not that. I, I have, you see, God gave John specific assignment. And that assignment was Isaiah 40. And he quoted it, Isaiah 40, verse 3. And, and so they asked me, who are you? You're the Messiah. I said, no, I'm not a Messiah. There's somebody else's Messiah. Not me. I'm there to prepare the way. So are you the prophet? And, and probably they refer to the one in Deuteronomy. That's, I totally believe that. Because it means that, okay, so there's the Messiah, there's a prophet, there's, there's all kinds of ideas. It could connect to a um, to different ways that the, it was presumed in the Jewish communities back then. Who would be, how would be happen? Would there be a prophet first, then the Messiah, or the Messiah and the prophet? It's, it, I honestly don't know. I really don't know the way, but I, I, I think that it had to do with the way they presumed it. But they asked him these three questions. If you're Elijah of Malachi, he said, no. Are you the Messiah? He said, no. Are you the prophet of Deuteronomy? He said, no. Then, so who are you? And he says, I am simply, I'm Isaiah 40. That's who I am. I'm there to prepare the way. And then Yeshua speaks about John later on. And he says, if you would like to receive him, he is that Elijah. In other words, he, he is Elijah to an extent of preparing the way, but not in the fullness of Malachi. Not in the fullness it. of Malachi, but in a part, part of it, right. yes, because John was there to bring the, 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 the baptism of repentance. Okay. Right. Yeah, I right. think that this. Oh, and one last question was about um, the, the spirit of Elijah and the fathers to the children and, and the adoption and, and Matthew 2 verse 5, is it? Where out of Egypt I've called my son at 2 verse 15. Matthew 2, verse 15, out of Egypt, I've called my son. And, there, mm -hmm. and e Israel is my firstborn son. 
So there's this fathers and the son with God and Israel. And it, and it happens in the desert. Like they learn their father's uh, chastisement and they learn his provision in the desert for 40 years. Uh, we, uh, that rather, we learned it for, for, in the desert for 40 years. But um, so my question we, is when we Saul didn't learn it. Crying, we should have, but we didn't. Yeah, we should have. <laughs> We should have. But do you think that that was a taste of this great spirit of adoption, this great when Saul starts to cry and he's like, my son, like he's, he, it's like this father, like, you know, spirit of Elijah, he lived in the desert. I don't know if that's something that you feel. Yeah, no, I, I don't know. I don't have particular, uh, particular, uh, you know, uh, connection to that. I think it's part of the story. I think that the spirit of Elijah, I mean, when we talk about nowadays, it's it's hating on several arenas, several areas, uh, and and that's according to Malachi also, and and not only Elijah's life, you know, uh, you know they killed all the prophets and they want to kill me, and I'm gonna run to the mountain of God. That's not that Elijah, the, the Elijah of Malachi, and there are several several uh, spheres that it's touching. Number one, it's touching on the sphere of conviction of or confrontation. Like prophets of Baal, there's a spirit of Elijah comes to bring confrontation to to a to a, uh, uh, um, a what's the word to the deception, to something that's not real, to the illusion of worship. Spirit of Elijah dis- comes to to bring this, and there's a lot in our world, in the Christian world, uh, of, of illusion and delusion, and and spirit of Elijah is going to confront this. That's number one. Not, so confrontation. Number two, it comes on um on the um on the area of 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 altar of true worship it's going to be an altar prophetic altar of true worship that is raising up that's the spirit of elijah and and prophetic worship and number three is going to have to touch generations in other words connection between generations we see nowadays i have little children you have i know many people understand this but we understand that the enemy's number one target is to destroy families and to, to divide the children and the parents spiritually, spiritually. There are so many parents, I've talked to some even today, of somebody that, that he, these parent, children grow up believing, God, man who is a believer, okay? It's just struggling with an idea that the children are not following God, okay? And so, so this issue is really, really the main issue that enemy is targeting, because, and the spirit of Elijah is going to come specifically to deal with this and confront us, the fathers, to say, you need to turn your heart to your children. What are you doing? You're turning your heart to your, you know, ministry, your whole whatever, but not to your children. But you got to do this. This is what God is calling. So, so Spirit of Elijah is those on these th- three levels. Okay, I'm just, uh, again, summarizing. Number one, confrontation. Number two, prophetic altar of worship, real true worship establishment. And number three, uh, generations. Okay, father to the children and then children to the father. And so the, the, these are the realms we can see the spirit of Elijah operating now as a preparation because what's going to happen is the judgment. We're, we're moving toward a judgment. And so if we're not ready, we're going to suffer much, much. And, and, and you know, you don't want to do this. It's a great, terrible day of the Lord. Terrible day of the Lord. Amen. And I love how you said out of, out of the desert, out of Bozrah, And that's where he goes. And it's like his garments turn red with blood. Well, we got to end. Be sure to share this. Everybody feel free to share this so others can understand more of the mystery that is Israel. It's so cool how you brought up how our flag, you know, is like the tzitzit. That's why they made the flag. That's why we made the flag blue and white like that. Because of the the prayer shawl on the end there, the the, the talus, the tzitzit. So it's so wonderful. So it's it's a symbol, symbol of, uh, so, so in the flag, there is a still symbol of the covenant somehow yeah. somehow, somehow. Yeah. even you know it's just this l- reminds us of the covenant and uh and so we we now we have yeah, it written on our hearts so we don't need to wear it we can just just have it on our hearts you know you can wear it if you want but that, that's not important it's important what's in your heart and so now it is in our yeah. hearts and praise the lord we can uh, we can we can have this uh, this this thing in our in our spirit so bless you and you know, next you should I say about the next week, Chaim? Yeah, so exciting. Uh, just so everyone here, they said they just love the these Thursdays. They look forward to it. They put the alarm on. They're just excited about it and never disappointed. Never uh, very, very excited about all that. Amazing. Um, yeah, go ahead. 
So next one is going to be the final uh, session for, for this period of time, unless we're going to, you know, decide with Chaim, just bring random subjects and discuss the Bible. But it, it won't be a presentation that I've prepared like these ones. Uh, there's one more final one uh, that uh, we'll do it uh, next week, and it has to do with Armageddon. So if, you, if you're interested in Armageddon, get on and, and enjoy. It's going to be beneficial. Bless you. Yeah, and last little thought. People are looking for a cure for COVID. They're looking for this and that. But that what you brought up is when and Getty turns alive, when the dead the dead sea becomes with filled with fish, and we you should get your fishing license and your fishing pole and go camp there and, right. and fish. But when it happens from the sanctuary, this this river will flow, and then of course on both sides there's those trees that bear fruit every every month, and the leaves you can actually eat them, and it heals you from any kind of plague that's amazing people need to be more in god's book and less in just their own uh thoughts and this gives us a picture of how of what will happen so thank you for reminding us of that hope and the great flood which will sweep some away but will will bring the, all of us into a deeper place of his spirit amen thank you Chaim. lots of love see you on thursday mm -hmm.